Hi, everyone. Hi, Rick. Good morning. Good morning. So um, I'm uh, excited to introduce Rick Van Den. Rick is a principal a cloud architect and Microsoft MVP. He's working with Microsoft Azure since it was first introduced. Rick is also an international speaker and a mentor. So thank you, Rick, for joining us. How are you doing today? Oh, well, I'm doing fine, thank you. Uh, hello from the Netherlands, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that name is hard, right? Rick van den Bos. That's how you pronounce it in Dutch, but just Rick is fine. No, no, <laughs> just, <laughs> no way. <laughs> uh, too difficult for me. Yeah, so, I can um, Rick, uh, again, thank you for joining. Uh, I, I can't hear, uh, I can't wait, sorry, to hear more about uh, Azure Cognitive uh, Services. Uh, so uh, the stage is yours. Um, I'm just adding your presentation to the screen. Ah, great. Um, okay. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ferret. Um, well, welcome. And uh, it's good to have you here. Welcome at uh, getting started with Azure Cognitive Services. I have a few slides and a lot of demos, so I'll just dive right in. Uh, just a little bit, uh, Vered already introduced me a little bit, but I'm Rick. Uh, I work from uh, for a company called Betabit. I'm a principal cloud architect, which actually means that I help companies make the transition into the cloud. And that can be either uh, rebuilding their entire software to be cloud native or do migration uh, uh, migrations towards a cloud native application. Um, you can hit me up at Twitter or e via email if you have any questions. But at the end of the slide, the slide deck, I will have some links that will help you um, get some more information. But first, let's have uh, the session already. So I'll do a short introduction, which I actually just did. I will show you something about using cognitive services. Then I have an extra uh, added component about security. We'll have a really brief conclusion and then some resources for you to use if you would like to start using Azure Cognitive Services. Now, um, a short introduction. So Cognitive Services actually are the services that enable you to infuse your apps and websites and bots with intelligent algorithms. And they can help your applications to uh, see, hear, understand, speak, or even interpret uh, user needs through natural me methods of uh, communication. So think about chatbots, think about uh, tools like Alexa or Cortana or Siri. Uh, those are all types of applications that are built with stuff like cognitive services. So there's some AI behind it and it enables you to interact with your user on a different level than just with a UI or text-based. So if you look at what cognitive services in Azure actually are, it's really, it's really, uh, I try to keep the slides short so I have a lot of time for demos. It's a set of services that do cool stuff on five different pillars. So let's look at the pillars that we have. Uh, we start out with decision. Uh, we have speech, language, vision, and search. And then uh, the reason for these five pillars is that this is where they actually work on right now. So they help you make decisions based on information that you get. Uh, they can help you do stuff with speech, so either speech to text or text to speech. And if you look at what the speech uh, is currently capable of, um, you almost, for instance, uh, cannot uh, hear anymore that text is being uh, read out by a computer-generated voice instead of a normal human voice. Uh, and then, like 20 years ago, if you put Windows Narrator on and you have it um, read out a website, it sounded a lot like a robot, uh, that's gone. Um, but also stuff with uh, language, vision, so images uh, and search. So if we look at uh, a few, and I'm not going to mention all of them, but if you look at the a few of the services that are under those five pillars, uh, what's really interesting, for instance, here is the, the lowest one, the anomaly detector, which actually enables you to have a look at data coming in and detect if something is happening or maybe even is about to happen. So think about a machine somewhere in a factory that has a lot of sensors for uh, maybe temperature or how fast stuff is going. And uh, normally it always operates somewhere around 20 degrees, for instance, but now you can see a slow incline in the temperature of the machine. That could indicate that it needs some um, 
some mechanic to work on it. Now, normally, we would wait for such a machine to break, probably, before we uh, send somebody in to go and fix it. But if we beforehand can get information out of that machine that maybe enables us to do uh, predictive uh, maintenance, that would mean that the machine will no longer go down, which also means that we can keep working better. Um, another thing is speech. I already said something about speech services, and it, it's able to convert audio to text or to do speech translation. Uh, and a really cool demo that you can also find, for instance, in the Ignite videos of Microsoft themselves is speaker recognition, which means let's say you're in a room with four people and you get a machine with speaker recognition uh, set up. It will automatically pick up who is talking and also write notes about what that person said uh, annotated with the person that actually said it, which means taking notes for a meeting uh, can be done automatically right uh, by now. Uh, then we have something about language like text analytics, uh, which enables you to see if a piece of text is uh, either positive or negative, um, but also translate stuff and understand what la language actually means. And that's the lowest item. It's actually called Luis. Uh, language understanding um, uh, in Azure. And Luis helps you to get the intent a user has. So a user says something to me, what does it actually want? What's the, the goal that they're trying to achieve? So for instance, if you say, uh, turn down the light, then the intent that gets out of language understanding would be uh, light, turn off. And that enables you to act on the uh, intent a user has if they speak to your application. If you look at the broad picture, you can see that there's actually quite a few cognitive services. So as we said, we have vision, we have speech, we have language. They called it in this overview, they called it knowledge. Uh, um, and that's specifically because Q&A service is now under there as well. And then we have some stuff with, uh, with search. These are all of the pillars that enable you to use cognitive services in your application. Now there's one uh, uh, set of services, which is actually the odd man out, which is search, because these used to be under Azure Cognitive Services. So all of the Bing uh, um, services that they use for Bing themselves are also available as services that you as a user can use and can leverage the power of. However, uh, with all of these Bing items, uh, if you go to the, um, cognitive services website on azure.com and you go to uh, web search, it now says that they are moving the Bing search APIs into a separate location. So they're actually marketing those as specifically being Bing services and they are no longer part of cognitive services. However, if you created one of them uh, under your cognitive services, then they will be um, supported for the next three years or uh, if the enterprise agreements ends. Um, and just before we go into the, um, uh, the demo, also something about pricing, uh, because cognitive services are, as you see here, services, and you pay for transactions, which means if you create a cognitive service and you don't do anything with it, you don't have any costs. And if you ask, uh, if you ask five things, you will have the cost for those five things. If you ask five million, well, costs will go up, of course. Um, so you pay for a transaction, but then the question is, what actually is a transaction? Um, if you look at the different types of services that are available under cognitive services, if you would like to recognize text, uh, in for instance, an image, then each post call that you do towards the service, where you actually post some text and you say, or post an image and you ask, hey, give me the text back, that's one transaction. Um, if you do a get call for a result, of an async service, those are counted as being a transaction, but getting results are free because you might want to get results multiple times uh, based off of one post that you did. So the one post is counted and charged and getting the results are actually free of charge. And then uh, for all other operations, you should see that uh, each feature that you use calls as a count, uh, sorry, counts as a transaction, which means and I'm going to have a demo about this later. So if I'm going too fast, I hope you can uh, get the information from there, uh, which means if you have an image and you would like it to be 
to, to check for celebrities, for instance, if you only ask it, are there any celebrities in here, then that will be one transaction. But if you ask, uh, are there landmarks here? Are there celebrities here? Where are the faces in the image? Are people looking happy or sad? All of those separate features you ask for are counted as one transaction. So I'm going to have a few examples in a bit, and you will see that there are quite a few features that I enable in that one call. So for each feature, you should count one transaction. Now then the question is, how do I wire things up to make sure that I can use cognitive services? Well, they're actually pretty straightforward. So there's um, a few things uh, that you can do to, to use them. And the most simple one is you can do just HTTP post and get calls uh, towards the API endpoint, uh, give it your data, and it will uh, run for you and give you the answer back. Um, there are also some client libraries available. So if you would like to have it inside of your C-sharp application, you would like to use SDKs to talk against uh, the cognitive services endpoints, that's fine as well. There's client libraries available. And for some of the services, you can even use a, a web portal to, uh, to make calls. There's some de decent documentation there, and there are a lot of examples available. So for instance, the code I will be showing uh, later on is available free on GitHub. Uh, you can go to uh, GitHub. Okay, so you can go to GitHub and find me. However, at the end of the slides, I have this really handy uh, QR code you can scan or just one URL and then all of the resources will be there. So you don't have to start going to GitHub right now. But if you look now at GitHub and you search for the word cognitive services, there are almost 2,500 repositories uh, that hit on cognitive services. So there's a lot available out there. Now, uh, all this talk is great, but the question is, how does this work? So let's demo this. And I'm going to see what happens if I do this. And then probably I need to pull this one in. Yeah, I'm still sharing this screen. So that's a good thing. So first of all, I'm not really sure how many of you have already um, worked with Azure before, but this is the Azure portal. I have it set to the dark team so that I uh, don't blind myself every time I go to the portal. Um, and then uh, you can see here that there's cognitive services as a service available, right? So you can also go to the dashboard here and go all services. And then if you look for cognitive services, which is probably under AI, then we can have cognitive services here. And then we see an overview of the cognitive services I have available for my in my subscription at this point. So looking at what I have right here, uh, we can see that there's some text analytics and there's some computer vision and there's some text translation. You can create all of these from the portal or from an, uh, an ARM template or um, infrastructure as code solution, by the way, those are also supported. But one of the things that's really cool uh, is if you wanted to use cognitive services uh, earlier, you would have to, for instance, say, okay, so I would like to do some text analytics and then you could go to text analytics and you could create that. And as with a lot of services under Azure, you get a key that actually enables you to call that service uh, and that you have the, the service available for you to use. However, um, if you would have, for instance, vision and text analytics and translator uh, all at the same time, you would have three different keys for three different services. So what Microsoft did right now is we can even go and say, I have, wow, I have cognitive services right here. We can now um, create cognitive services as a umbrella over all of our cognitive services that we would like. And you can even get one uh, key that enables you to call different types of cognitive services. So they're making it way easier to do uh, different uh, cognitive services in one application because you now only need one key. Currently, Vision, language, search, and speech it can now work with a single API. Microsoft has stated that, uh, that they are actively working on getting all of the uh, cognitive services to be under this one umbrella where you can use one key for all of them. Now, if we look in what I have available right here, uh, and I will 
I actually forgot to open Postman, but that's also a huge part of my um, of my demo. So I need that too, um, because I would like to go into uh, some actual demos right now. I'm going to open up real quick, uh, zoom it so I can zoom in for you if I uh, want to show something. And then we have cost cognitive services here. And let's see if we zoom. Ah, we zoom in the shared thing as well. So that's a cool, good thing. So what you see right here is a request that I am preparing to go into cognitive services uh, vision. And then you can see here that there's a couple of features that I'm asking for. Categories, so categorize the image that I sent to you and give me some information about that. Uh, give me some tags. So for instance, uh, animal, person, building, car, uh, description. So it generates a description for the image I'm sending. Uh, faces, where are faces in this uh, location or in this image located? A type of image but also a primary and secondary uh, foreground and background colors and adult. And the adult is uh, cognitive services enabling you to actually see if a image contains adult or racy content so that you can, for instance, filter it by default from your forum so that somebody can look at it and make sure that there's nothing uh, strange going on there. And I'll also ask for, for uh, details. Uh, as celebrities, which means I'm going to look in the image and see if there's a celebrity available in the image that I'm posting. Now, first of all, I got this image and I'm sending this over to Cognitive Services and I'm getting an answer. And then you can see uh, categories are people and people portraits. So this is probably an image from somebody uh, uh, that looks like a portrait. So there's no adult or racy content. So it's actually 0.00, .00 which means 0% uh, adult or racy. There's something about colors and accent colors and uh, clip arts. Okay, so it's 99.8% confident that there's a person in this picture. And also 99% sure that there's a human face in this image. And apparently there's a wall and a smile in there as well. So there's a lot of information. It's actually a woman, as we can see. So here are the tags that are automatically added to the image. And then it automatically creates a caption that says it's a woman smiling for the camera. Now, of course, we need to know which image this is. So I'll do this. I'll go to zoom out just a little bit right now because the image, I think, will be pretty clear. Ah, we know her. So there's a wall in there and a smile. and. Um, Azure Cognitive Services recognized you. Now, the next one, which is also pretty interesting, and I'm going to zoom in for this one again, uh, I have the same visual features selected, but now I have a different image. And let's see what happens when, when we send this information. Okay, so there's some people, but now something specifically is happening since it says in the details, I have celebrities. And it did not only with 99.99% um, accuracy see that such an Adela is in there, but it also sees Bill Gates, apparently. And here it gives, it gives us the uh, location of where the face of Bill Gates is actually located in the image. And then the cool thing now is if I scroll down a bit, and this might be a bit hard to read, but here it's interesting because you can see that in the description of this image, it actually uses the celebrities that it already recognized in the image. So it's saying that this is a picture of Sacha, Nadella, and Bill Gates are posing for a picture. So that's something we need to check. So I'm zooming out again, uh, going to the body to get the image. And of course, you guys know already, and girls, of course, that actually this is a picture of Bill Gates and Sacha Nadella. Uh, so that's actually pretty powerful already. Um, but there's more. Of course, there's always more. One other demo that I have is a dem demo of uh, this custom vision thing. And I'm guessing that it might be interesting first to explain what custom vision actually is. So what I did yesterday is I created a vision project where I actually said, I would like to train a model based on some information that I give it to be able to distinguish two different types of food that are very similar. 
So, of course, I looked into uh, what might be interesting in the Netherlands, where I'm from, and those are Bitterballe, because I think we're the only company that actually creates Bitterballe, which you can see in the image right here. And if we look at Israel, uh, one of the things that stands out, and I have to clip that again, is uh, falafel, because that's something that's very Israeli. However, they kind of look like Bitterballe, right? So... What I actually did is these are 23 images of Bitterballe that I actually added to uh, the project. And then I added 20 image images of falafel. Uh, and I actually just tagged each image. So this is a Bitterballe and this is falafel. So the application was trained based on information I gave it. And it's only 23 images for Bitterballe and 20 images for falafel. And then I trained it in the quick sense. Uh, I need to maybe uh, explain. You can do a quick training, which is very fast. And we can also do an advanced training where I say, okay, so you can train for seven hours on these images. Most of the time you do this when you have a lot more information available. So I trained it based on these 43 images in total. And then what happens if we do a quick test and I browse for a local file, then I have two, two images, of course, Maybe the name gives it away, but I can assure you that it's not working on, uh, on the name. So if I pick the falafel one, it will automatically process this one. And you can see with 99.9% .9 accuracy, the system know knows this is uh, falafel. Now, if I add an image of uh, Bitterball, which again, I think on some Im images looks a lot like uh, falafel, it's already 98.6% sure that these are Bitterball instead of falafel. Now, this is, of course, uh, a little uh, funny experiment, but I even know that there are very big lighting manufacturers that have a lot of counterfeit products being uh, sold out there uh, from which they don't even know themselves that it's counterfeit because they are so looking, uh, looking the same. Uh, so they trained actually a model on the boxes that the lights come in that helps them distinguish if something is an actual article or um, a counterfeit. Now, if you want to have something like this and talk to it uh, from an application, you have all kinds of information available right here. Um, so there are some project IDs and some keys in here. Uh, don't be afraid. I will recycle the keys right after <laughs> we're done. Um, but based on this information, you have this project ID here, and we have a key here and an endpoint. We can talk to this, right? So from uh, a normal uh, HTTP post, this would be something like, uh, this is custom vision, the one that I need, is I would like to talk to Cognitive Microsoft Com, um, custom vision with my prediction model. And here I can take an image that I have available online, send it over, and apparently for this image, cognitive service thinks that it's 99.9% .9 sure it's falafel. So that's an API call I can do to use this model. But of course, as always, there's more. And because of time, I'm going to go speed up just a little bit. Please let me know if I speed up too much um, because we can do this in code as well. So for instance, uh, what I can do is uh, I can, of course, create, uh, or sorry, not of course, this is uh, using the client, I can create a custom vision prediction client. So I would like it to predict something about my image, load the image up in the, uh, in the application, and then ask for the client to classify the image based on the information I have to talk to my project. And then I could show you, if I run this, it actually sends the information into the custom vision, we get the information, and we process it from there. Um, but, and I'm going to go into just one more before I uh, switch over to the slides again, because I'm already running out of time because I'm so enthusiastic about everything that I can do here. Um, for instance, if I set this as a startup project and I run this, and then I, of course, zoom in a bit as soon as it's available. Uh, what I created here was a client to talk to a translator service. So I say, Hello, allemaal bij deze sessie. So that's Dutch. And it translates it into uh, hello all to this session. So I translated Dutch into English and it does that for me. 
And, it's, and uh, if I say bedankt dat je er bent, it will automatically say thank you for being here. So that's translating it for you. Again, uh, I might be going in a bit fast right now, but this information is all also available online. Um, and then there's one thing that I actually still want to uh, show you after that we had the demo, because some people might say, okay, so this is cool, uh, but what about security? What about my data? Where's my data going? And what is Microsoft doing with that data? And maybe sometimes I have some information uh, that I don't want to share, and then, then what, I, what do I do? So uh, going into security, Microsoft is a data processor for these services, which means um, uh, your data is relatively safe, right? But if you go into, uh, oh, sorry, you have control over your storage and deletion of any customer data. But if you go into uh, the Bing services, for instance, please be advised that Microsoft is an independent data controller, which means that the data is treated differently. And Microsoft may use that data to improve their uh, products and services. Um, so make sure that you have that, uh, have that knowledge. But then of course, I can also uh, hear you saying, so what if I'm in a factory? and I have that anomaly detector available, or I want to do some translation or some, some text analytics, but my internet's slow today or something's not working, or I'm at a remote location where internet maybe doesn't work. Well, there's a solution for that as well. However, uh, normally when I do this demo, I actually physically unplug my machine from internet. <laughs> but if I do that now, I might <laughs> run into a different issue. So I'm not going to do that one, but I am going to do a little a demo if I can skip out from here. I will make sure that these are all gone so that we can zoom into this one. Because what Microsoft actually uh, enabled us to do, and to do so, I'm going to go into my cognitive services and I'll take this one right really fast. What Microsoft enabled us to do, zoom it in, is we can use a Docker container in the Microsoft Container Registry under Azure Cognitive Services, which is in this case, sentiment analysis. And I can run that Docker container locally um, and have text analytics be available to me without me being connected to the internet. So while that runs, I'm going to go over and make sure that I have something open here so that I know what I'm doing. So this is actually uh, right now spinning up a Docker container. So if we look into my Docker desktop, dashboard, if that shows up, you can see here that Nostalgic Bose uh, is currently running for MCR Microsoft Com uh, with, the, uh, with the sentiment analysis, which means that if I now go to my application and I have this um, sentiment analysis application right here, uh, which does um, sentiment analysis based on text, and I can do that either through uh, a client, which I do here, or via an HTTP call, which I do here. And again, all of these are available online, so um, you can have a look at the code in a bit more uh, timely manner later. Uh, but if I run this now, uh, while I say that I would like to run against my local machine, which I do by changing the endpoints. So I'm physically changing the endpoint. I'm now talking to text analytics on localhost 5000. I'm running this. The functions start running, and then if I analyze something that's kind of uh, horrible, because it says this is a horrible example, and I run this, it will actually say to me, if my uh, dark container is running, nope, it's not running yet. And that's always the case with, uh, uh, that's always the case, of course, with demos. Probably I need to use this one because I have a different endpoint. There we go. So here you can see now that I actually sent in two different types of things, like thank you so very much for joining me and super bedankt dat je bij deze enorm tof sessie bent, which actually says the first one is really positive. It's actually 1.0 positive, so it's only positive. And the second one is positive as well, since it's in Dutch, the same as the uh, message up there. Now, what happens when you run uh, your application on a Docker, Docker container is no customer data is ever sent to Microsoft. However, you do need to specify a key and the customer, sorry, cognitive services endpoint when running this Docker container. And then you might say, well, that's odd. 
Well, the reason for this is that um, um, billing data is sent to Microsoft. So no customer data flows into Azure if you use this, but billing, so the amount of requests that you did actually does flow because they still need to bill you somehow. The last thing I would like to show about this container is actually also pretty powerful because if you go to localhost and let's say 5,000, because that's the one, you can even add Swagger, which enables you to do, okay, so I have a post for text analytics sentiment analysis and I have previews for sent, uh, sentiment analysis. So they actually built in an entire Swagger documentation for you to be able to have a look at this. Um, finishing up because I'm already running out of time or at least almost. So with container support, uh, you have control over the data, over the model updates, because you're the one that actually says, now I would like to get a new version of a container that gives me a new model of text analysis, for instance. It's a port portable architecture that enables you to do high throughput and low, la low latency. Again, the endpoint is strictly used for billing only. No customer data will ever flow that way, which means if you run this in a container, your data is safe within your own infrastructure. So currently there are quite a few services available uh, under container support. I just used uh, text analytics, but there's also language understanding or face recognition or the OCR, so uh, character recognition, so re you know, recognizing text from an image. Those are all available. Please be advised. By default, there is no security on the Cognitive Services Container API, so you need to do something there yourself. Wrapping up really quickly because I think this was a lot of information in half an hour. Cognitive services, as far as I'm concerned, are huge. Using cognitive services is really simple. And I think that container support is actually pretty cool. Scan this OCR uh, or this QR code or go to theurlist.com slash cogserve. I've had a lot of different um, types of information available right there. Uh, links to documentation, uh, links to my examples. Uh, you can find it all over there. Um, I can see two questions. You talked about prediction services. Would it fit to risk prediction in general to governance activities? I think it's an aid. I think it never uh, replaces, but I think it does help you in uh, uh, identifying issues faster. And then which of your recommended tools do you think is best overall for Azure beginners? Well, that's actually a really hard question because Azure is huge. I started out when Azure also started, so I jumped on the Azure tray right away. Um, we had like five services, and then uh, it grew from there. Currently, we, ha we have, I think, more than 180 different types of services under Azure. I think most importantly to have a look at is either app services if you're running web applications or uh, serverless, and then I'm talking more in the order of uh, like Azure Functions. Uh, if you want to have uh, background tasks uh, running, I think that App Services and Functions both would be uh, most interesting to look at if you're venturing into Azure for the first time. So, wow. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm so sorry for running over time. No, it's okay. Actually, we really enjoyed it. Uh, so thank you, uh, Rick. It was actually mind-blowing. I yeah. love examples. <laughs> thank you for uh, my picture. It was uh, like uh, awesome. So <laughs> definitely being uh, innovative in the cognitive uh, domain, allowing allowing us, uh, the users and companies, uh, to get some unbelievable capabilities uh, out of the box. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rick. Uh, that was uh, again awesome. Up okay. Next, well. Yes. Yeah. I, sorry. Thanks for having me once again, and have a lot of fun uh, today with the MVP days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, so uh, up next. Uh, we will have uh, Shiri Arad will uh, join us to talk about scalable compute capacity, uh, uh, Azure Spot uh, VMs. Stay tuned. We will take a short break, uh, about uh, 10 minutes, uh, and we will be back. <laughs> 